creativenotcorporate.com proudly presents the Creative Not Corporate Pop Culture and Media Podcast, chronicling the ongoing pop culture battle between the creative minds of music, movies, TV, and radio, and the corporate suits that control them. Now, please welcome your host, a digital media professional with over 25 years experience in all forms of traditional and digital media, not to mention managing two of the largest online radio podcast networks on earth. Here is the king of podcasts. Black Panther is roaring past a half a billion dollars in the box office. As we get started on this week's Creative Not Corporate podcast, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. Got a guest for you tonight. A little bit later on, uh, yours truly will be speaking with University of Florida Communications Professor Andrew Selipak, who is also Director of the Graduate Program in Social Media. We're going to go ahead and talk about so much when it comes to social media, students and what they're taking away from all the pop culture that's going on now in their music, their movies, their TV, what are they binging, what are they watching, what are they listening to, and where the social media and how corporate and creative are utilizing it and taking advantage of it or not taking advantage of it, and how big a deal is social media becoming towards all the content that we're consuming. That's all going to come up in that interview in a few moments, I want to just go through some quick headlines. I want to get started and talk about Black Panther. I know everybody's talked about it. I'm pretty sure many of you watched it over the weekend. So let's go to the latest news about Black Panther before I go and give you my review of it. As of recording, as of what was, oh, as of press time, that's how they always call it, right? Disney Marvel's Black Panther is poised to bound across the $500 million worldwide mark nine days after its release. Current growths with international box office, $491.1 million. Domestically, 200, oh, sorry, $213 million international. So put that together, was that what? $280 million domestic? Just blew away everything else. And I mean, nine days, week and a half. One weekend so far, the President's Day weekend, big, big bucks. Through Tuesday in 48 markets, the movie had already broken $200 million. Damn. So there you go. And why did it make so much effing money? Well, it was good. It was really good. I was, you know, I wasn't surprised we were going to get to where they were with it, but I'm glad that actually, you know, the movie... Regardless of what people wanted to say about the social justice, political side of it, I'm not caring about that, of course. Try to keep everything apolitical. Just how things are. Let's look at the more important, the brighter side, the more important things of the content itself, of the project. Okay. Black Panther had good characters. It was exciting. Had a little bit of funny to it. But Chadwick Boseman, great uh, job doing the Black Panther character. Michael... Michael B. Jordan, I'm telling you, just knocked it out of the park. A good asshole villain. I mean, it was really good. Listen, you, you wanted to, like, you, you felt like hating the guy, but he was a badass. That was the other thing. It was a good villain, a good badass villain. And he took control and, you know, all chaos ensued. It was good. It kind of had a feel like of how Thor's Oscar universe feels like. The The costuming was really cool. The whole look of it, the feel, the sound, the Kendrick Lamar soundtrack. Loved it all. It was really good. And for some people that actually told me they thought that the movie dragged a little bit, no, I didn't think so at all. I think they had a good reason to go with everything that they did. Fixing all the women kicking ass was pretty good. That's, that's cool. All in all, A... Grade A for Black Panther. They did a hell of a job. Good stuff. So congratulations to them. Now, I want to give a little bit of a heads up of what we're going to be having coming up in the next couple of weeks before we get to our guest. One of the stories I want to bring up before I get to that, as I go and take care of movies, take care of the movie section of the podcast this week. There was a story in Forbes.com from Andy J. Simoniak. 
asking, how can U.S. filmmakers make more movies and earn more money? Start with immigration. And the idea is to kind of go and work more towards expanding the global market. And he says this, a U.S. filmmaker with the help of immigration, tax, and financial advisors can find a foreign investor already working in the entertainment or allied industry abroad to help him or her set up a U.S. company. The new company is created as a film finance and production company with film distribution rights in the investor's home country and elsewhere. For investors uh, saying a minimum of $350 million U.S., the investor's foreign company becomes 100% owner of the U.S. company. No, we don't need to go through this, okay? <laughs> this whole thing right here, I just thought was funny. Like, you cannot just go the traditional route, make good creative movies. You feel like, oh, you got to, you know, take you some loophole and go overseas with your company to get a bankroll, to get bankroll a project. Or to make projects uh, at a lower cost. And there's also the idea of financing independent films. And the same idea, using foreign source investor funding. The investor puts up, say, $250,000, which goes to the filmmaker's company for the project. Each project should be a separate company. The filmmaker uses the funds to finalize the script. The script is the key. Then the filmmaker and the investor seek out a production budget based on the script, the filmmaker's credentials, the foreign investor's credentials, and support. Between the script being finalized, pre-production, principal production, and post-production, and the going on going distribution, each film may safely take up to seven years, which aligns nicely with an L1 visa maximum time frame. The foreign distribution component ensures that this is not just a one film production company, but an ongoing business. Fees for immigration, tax, and financial advice will probably take up most of the balance as investors' $350,000 investment. If you have to go that route, because you're trying to go the cheap way to make a movie or make a project, <sighs> wow. What's wrong with the investors not coming into this country and putting money in? I just thought this story was <laughs> because of the fact that you are not accepting the right projects you go for the safe bets you are afraid of taking the risks of going after a movie that could go really big and banking instead you're conglomerating bill movie companies you're putting them together and you're just putting out big movies with big reputations disney and marvel putting out a big movie like that star wars same thing so afraid to push the envelope and go for something that might be out there to see if it might work. Nobody wants to do that. Or we want to play it safe. Screw that. Why do we want to play anything safe? If you, what you don't do is invest with foreign investors to save money on a movie. No. What you do is you invest in the project. If you know it's good, you put the gamble on it. Put your balls up there, okay, buddy? Come on, you movie moguls. Put your balls up there and show me you can make a good movie. You back a real creative product, and then you talk to me if you need to go ahead and start looking for some cheap skate route to go outside of the country to fund your films. It's sickening. I, I just I had to say something about that. I see that story and I'm saying, what are you doing? What are you trying to tell people? If you know how to make money, you don't need to skip out of town to make it. Okay? It's a fair playing field. If you know what you're doing, you can make a lot of money here. And there should be no question why people can't make money at the movies. Funny, I have an interview that I had done today that is going to be coming up in a couple of weeks where I brought up Byron Allen. You know Byron Allen? Real people? Do you remember him back in the 80s? Early, early 80s? You know that guy right now? He is funding himself independent movies, and he's just bankrolling them. And this is where after he's been doing 
comedy.tv, recipe.tv, all these side cable channels that just run some of the same programming that he bulked together and put together, you know, over, what, a 10-year period? Doing, you know, really low-budget, cheap, but quality programming like Comics Unleashed, the comedy.tv, doing uh, courtroom shows with Christina Perez and others. And that's what he did. And he made big money off of those shows, off of all these programs that could run daytime, nighttime, whatever times that affiliates need to go and put a show in. And by doing that, that guy this year bankrolled Hostiles, which is getting critical acclaim, and the Hurricane Heist, which is coming up March 9th, full release to theaters. Byron Allen, Entertainment Studios, Entrepreneur. I don't think I've ever read anything about that guy having to go out and go out and look for foreign investors. No. Uh uh-uh. uh. Just keep that in mind. And by the films this week, like I said, Black Panther, number one across the board, $242.2 million as of the weekend. Peter Rabbit, 23.4. 50 Shades Freed was third with 19.4. Jumanji, 10 million. Still, that thing's making $10 million, fourth place. 15, 17 to Paris, 8.9 million, rounding out the top five. Six Greatest Showman, seventh Early Man, Maze Runner. Eighth, Winchester, ninth, the post, tenth. So, coming up a little later on, we're going to talk about the top five of the Billboard Hot 100 all staying in place. Another big week for God's plan and Drake. Quincy Jones takes back his takes back his words about pop music and Taylor Swift. We'll preview Game Night and Annihilation coming to the movies this week. And we'll give a little preview of some guests we have coming up down the line here on the podcast. And why 99% of all music streaming comes from just 10% of available songs. And one other story for the National Choir, music industry sex perverts unmasked in Hollywood. It's all coming up. But first, it's time to go ahead and play back that guest interview I had with University of Florida Communications Professor Andrew Sellebeck here on the Creative Not Corporate Podcast. Joining me on the show, I have Professor Andrew Selipak. He's director of the Master of Arts and Mass Communication Program with a specialization in social media at the University of Florida in Gainesville as part of the College of Journalism and Communications. And he also teaches courses in the tel- Department of Telecommunication at the University of Florida. Professor Selipak, welcome to the Creative Not Corporate Podcast. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to have you. I would love to get the educator's perspective as to what you're telling the people that are potentially going to be working on major media projects. They're going to be thrown out of college into the corporate world, into that world so that they can build their careers on, whether it is through social media, whether it is through entertainment, whether it is in front of a mic, uh, in front of a microphone, behind the microphone, behind the scenes, or it's in front of a camera, behind the camera. I want to find out what you're telling these kids and what you're doing to prep them and what you're getting as feedback from them. So first of all, give me an idea of what the classroom looks like, all the classrooms that you uh, teach in, the type of students to make up and how they respond to you when it comes to understanding media and understanding social media in general. So there's kind of a lot to unpackage in that particular statement and question. Um, and the big thing that I see with the students is that you know they're interested in doing something creative. They're interested in doing something that they'd enjoy. Um, you know, they want to be involved in this kind of creative process. Whether it could be in front of the camera, behind the camera, it could be behind a computer screen using Photoshop, digital video editing, and posting to social media. So, uh, one of the big things that I think is kind of different that I see with my students as opposed to maybe students that want to study finance or, or study engineering is they have a really big expectation that what they're going to be doing will be interesting uh, and, and that they will enjoy their job. And I, I think part of that comes from the fact that they know, especially with the first job that they're going to get, it's not something that's going to be paying them the big bucks. Uh, so it's important that they're going to enjoy what they're doing. Absolutely. 
social media to sell this to parents and let them realize that if a child, if, if a student is going to go ahead and take a social media class with you, professor, and trying to sell that to parents and say, well, you know, where's the monetization of that? Where is it that, I mean, what is it that you do to convince the students, let alone parents, why there's an importance of social media and how maybe they're behind the eight ball. They don't realize how big a deal it is and how great a career move it is to get into social media if you're not going into traditional traditional media. Well, I mean, I think it's dependent on the class. Uh, one of the classes that I, I teach and I've been teaching for two years now uh, is a sports and media class where each week we have a different guest speaker who Skypes in, uh, talks to the students about the job that they have, what they do at their job. And uh, for the most part, there are a lot of former students of mine. Um, they've been my student one, two, three, sometimes four times. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about how they work in social media. Um, earlier in the semester, we had a former student of mine. She does social media for the Philadelphia Phillies. Wow. And she talked about how her job was to do social media for the Phillies. In particular, she does a lot when it comes to Twitter, uh, kind of letting the fans know what's going on with the team or you know, letting them know about games or, or information that they might need during the game, whether it's even keeping up with the box score. Uh, the following week, we had, I had another former student of mine who does social media for the Atlanta Falcons and you know, explained you know, how the digital skills that he needs when it comes to photo editing and video editing, um, understanding the metrics behind it. So mm -hmm. you know, some of it comes from literally having other former UF grads talk to the students, whether it's Skype or in person, about the job they have in social media. And then it becomes a lot easier to explain to students there are jobs out there like this when you have someone talk to them who has a job exactly like that. And now, while you're doing this, one thing that's always important to me when I have had interns work for me in my full-time work is the importance of internships and being able to build upon the career you want to be in because you need to be in there and carry some water for some big wigs that will then look at you later on and give you a good recommendation and at least obtain some credit. How important is that? The, what, how much do you stress the students about the importance of internships, about getting them into the career field and doing as much as they can to get involved before they leave and graduate? Well, part of that's you know the kind of the idea that you know most jobs want somebody who wants experience before they hire them, even for you know a, a first time person. Um, and and I really talk to them about internships a lot, and and I do this in multiple classes. Um, you know, going back to the sports class again, you know, the University of Florida is, I think, and the students at the University of Florida are exceedingly lucky. Uh, because right here in the communications building, we have an NPR affiliate, we have a PBS affiliate, we have an ESPN affiliate, we have our own weather channel, our own TV weather channel here in the building. Mm -hmm. um, we have the SEC network here, we have a country station, we have a top 40 station, we've got a lot of media properties that are right here in the building. And I'm constantly telling the students essentially like, hey, you don't have to wait till summer, you don't have to wait till your winter break. You can go get experience tomorrow right here in the building. And those opportunities, um, I think, are just in incredible that the students here can take advantage of. Me, as an undergrad, um, I did undergrad at the University of Virginia. We did not have remotely close to these possibilities or right. opportunities. And no. at the same time, <laughs> I did not take advantage of them either. Oh, um, not, and that, I'll tell you, it was for me, it was, it was a matter of trying to do as much as I could. Whether it was the, the FAU I went to as uh, the school newspaper, or it was the radio station, which only got out one watt outside of the outside off the campus under Chapter Fifteen, or whatever it might have you. So we, it was a matter of finding every chance and every way to get and sell the in some kind of media entity. And I can imagine. Listen, I'll vouch for University of Florida has a great media program, great journalism program. I've had students come across where I've worked, and they've done very well, and they have taken advantage of working at you know the, the affiliates up there. You got some great radio stations up there that people don't want to talk about, but very prominent and very good talent. It, it's not a small market. It doesn't get treated like a small market, which is really wonderful to see about Gainesville. Um, so, and you know, and that's the thing. Like they they have the opportunities to literally do this stuff because you have you know people who work full time at the stations and they're the the news directors and the sports directors, but the content's created by the students, which is. 
exceedingly valuable. Kind of going with what you were saying, when I was an undergrad, I did not take advantage of those opportunities. Right. I, it wasn't until really my fifth year of college that I got an actual internship working in radio. Uh, prior to that, I, my assumption was, well, I'm going to graduate, I'm going to walk across the stage, and I'm just going to be handed a job. Um, <laughs> and, and as everybody who knows, once you start working in it, that's not quite how it happens. No. <laughs> so I, I actually use myself again and again and again, almost as the example of what not to do. And I, I think it kind of works with the students because, you know, I'm speaking from personal experience of, hey, I wanted to do exactly what you all are doing. I didn't prepare myself. I didn't go for internships. I didn't get the experience. And then at my first job, it, you know, it, I almost didn't get it. Uh, I, I didn't get an actual real job when I first graduated. I, I got hired to work one day a week. Um, and explaining to them, like, through the personal experience, I think it resonates more, might have a little more weight. Uh, and if nothing else, it, it then gets into the importance of don't be like me. I'm telling you not to be like me. Uh, and I, I think it, it, not for everybody, but for enough of them, it kicks in, especially because, you know, week after week, I'll actually ask them, you know, decide, depending on the size of the room, you know, who did anything this week? What did you do? What did you do? And then it's, it, it becomes like a, a, an additional motivation because then it's that keeping up with the Joneses. My peers are doing it. My peers are doing things I wish I was doing. Uh, if they can do it, I can do it. And then they go volunteer and get the opportunities I keep trying to explain to them that they need. Now, through my experience, when I have talked about what kind of career field certain people that I have had that dealt with as students, I'm sure you have the same thing where it is a bit of a totem pole. You look at movies, you look at you know either, either screenwriting or working behind the scenes, uh, directing, producing, cinematography, or acting or, you know, acting in front of a camera and doing anything that's worth the television, you know, maybe some people will look at that and say, okay, well, I might not have the writing skills. I might not have the uh, visual appeal. So radio looks like something I could do because I could, that's a good start off point. That's a good place where I can begin. I don't, I won't be uh, subjected to being on camera and being nervous. I'll be less nervous here. And then radio becomes what begets to the next thing. Like it was a traditional thing where radio used to elevate you into television, which elevated you into something bigger. Is that something that still stands true today? I mean, do you feel like the the students you deal with now, they want to do radio first and then they can be encouraged to do something more with video and so on. Well, one of the things that, that we do uh, with one of my classes is we start by having them write radio stories. And the reason for that is essentially like when you're writing a radio story, you're, you're learning a different type of storytelling, um, but you're not having to kind of combine the visual and the audio together mm -hmm. into one story. You're learning how to tell this different type of story in a different way. And it's the best way to kind of learn. It's the, you have to learn how to crawl before you can walk, before you can run. And even as somebody who spent time in radio, I think it's the best way to kind of get your feet wet and first get that kind of first interest, first ability to participate, first ability to try. And even um, you know, our telecom, telecom news degree is set up that way. The, the yeah. students who begin the degree, the very first class they have is to basically put – six hours each week in at our uh, NPR affiliate here in the building. Mm -hmm. And that's where they get the real world experience of you're going to do stories that are going to go out and be heard by an audience that, you know what, they are sitting around all day mistake or if you say something wrong, they're going to call in and tell you. Uh, you know, you're going to hear about anything that you did wrong, whether it was mispronounced the name of a town um, or if you just had any kind of error in there. And that's if the news director doesn't catch it and tell you about <laughs> it as well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think it's a great place to, to get your feet wet, to, you know, to get your bearings, uh, and then to learn how to just tell someone's story where, you know, we, we spend plenty of time telling our own stories, you know, from, I tell my students from day one, we learned how to, uh, communicate on an interpersonal level. Right. We were born, we cried, we cried and said, it's, you know, bright out here. I don't like it. Uh, 
it's cold out here. I don't like it. So from day one, we've learned how to tell our own story, but to tell someone else's story and to be interesting is a skill that needs to be developed. Now, here's the thing. The style of story is what's important to me, too, is because in radio, at least in my, and also in certain areas, there's a refined way of storytelling, which is what I believe NPR is. All due respect. It's, it's very cultured, very uh, upper. You have to be well-educated. It has to be, you know, a, a certain grade level. And then there's mainstream writing that is adaptable and consumable to all audiences. Is that something that you take into account that there should be two ways of story writing? Oh, I, I actually would probably tell them there are multiple ways of story ah, writing. Okay. You know, when, when they're learning to write scripts, I say essentially, you know, you're writing for the station that you work at. And while there are some basics that are going to be true, every station is going to have a slightly different style. Um, just the way they start a story could be a little bit more sensational than others. And yeah, while NPR is going to definitely have that, uh, you know, a little bit potentially drier delivery and, and storytelling style, uh, I come at it from the perspective of my first job out of undergrad was working at a classic rock station, which is obviously a very different type of way of speaking on right, air right. Uh, and, and working at a sports radio station where I had a call in sports show, which was obviously different than working at the classic rock station, which would, had been different prior to working at a news radio station as an internship as an undergrad. Now, um, as, in, did, in terms of storytelling, I got to ask this question. Have you used yeah. the serial podcast as an example of what would be really good, a good role model of storytelling? We talk about it only in so much as, you know, that's much more long format. Um, okay. We do kind of focus a little bit more on, you know, shorter stories that you would hear in that, you know, top of the hour, bottom of the hour newscast for uh, radio or for, you know, the local news coverage, uh, you know, stories being a minute long or under a minute yeah. long. Um, not necessarily the long format stories, but even, you know, honestly, even today uh, in class, we were going over feature stories, which, as you know, is a, a different than, say, an investigative story or a uh, right. sports or a news piece. And, you know, one of the things that I end on, because, you know, I understand there's, there are students who have no desire to want to work in news or sports or entertainment or weather. Um, and, and kind of at near the end of this lecture, I basically go, well, those of you who don't want to work at news, you probably enjoyed these feature stories. Well, guess what a documentary film is? That's it's exactly a long right. Feature story. Yes, and there's and such it, good uh, it, such good business for documentaries right now for you know, whatever you want, whether it's on Netflix or for feature films. It's is very bankable. I mean, what a career you could do, no matter what. And I mean, it, you can look at just YouTube. I mean, you, you get enough yeah. views on YouTube, you'll start making money there or doing short films, you know, ESPN with the 30 for 30 series. Um, you know, I, I catch myself watching different, uh, you know, either sometimes even short documentaries on Netflix and Amazon, just because, it, you know, I, I, there might be a bit of a nerd showing there with the, you know, being a, having a PhD, but I like documentaries. <laughs> I, I find so, uh, like I can learn stuff from them. And they're interesting if done well. And, you know, so a lot of it is telling them that there are different ways to tell a story. Um, there's just some basic skills that are going to hold true regardless of the story that you tell. You know, we, I'll, I'll discuss how, you know, kind of the, the classic filmmaking is, you know, the story's told in three acts and yeah. what the different parts of, of the, the story would be told in three acts and looking at, you know, things like the climax and everything else. And, you know, it's different from telling a news story or it's different from telling a sports story. Uh, it, it's It's just one of those things where, I, I feel like I'm to an extent I'm lucky. I have a I'll teach a class sometimes eighty to one hundred and twenty students, and the students in that class will say everything from I want to work for a national news station in front of the camera to I want to uh, work on a film, I want to work on a TV show, yeah. I want to work for the Discovery Channel, or I want to do social media for a sports team. And, now, let me ask you, know, you this: that, oh, 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 sorry, I want to get into another question because I want to, I don't want to lose the spot, but. When you started talking about the types of movies that have different acts, and, and the, when you started making references, I want to find out about the references you make in class. So when it comes to mainstream movies or television or other projects or music, whatever it is, what is it that you like to reference as the very best of the best? 
Well, the one thing I will say is that I, I think as you get older, your taste in music just does not connect to maybe the younger audience, the younger generation. Right. I, you know, having been a rock DJ, I think somewhere around, you know, whatever music you were listening to around your last few years of high school, that becomes what you consider the best music of all time. But I mean, I still and think you could still say a Stones or Beatles would be an example that a lot of younger, uh, younger people could really adapt to. They have already. Well, and, and to an extent, yes. Um, you know, if I bring up the, you know, some of them, uh, I actually would, would, you know, growing up, I listened to a lot of classic rock myself that sure. came out long before I was born. Um, but even, you know, I, I'll reference Tupac or Biggie because sure. that's kind of what I listened to in high school. Yeah. Um, for them, it's not quite the same. Um, and a couple of years ago, I actually was going through uh, a lecture and I talked about uh, this uh, commercial that Bob Dylan did for Victoria's Secret and how it was a little kind of creepy. And a lot of them didn't know who Bob Dylan really was in his music. Right. They had heard of him, but that was about it. So the next day in class, I came in. I was like, I want to explain to you the value of Bob Dylan. Uh, and I, I went through one of Bob Dylan's songs and just kind of went through the lyrics and referenced yeah. like how they, were, they, re they reflected the historical time in which they were done. And then I picked another song that had been popular within the past year, and a song you may not even heard of. The song was called Bubble Butt, uh -huh. and that was essentially all the lyrics. <laughs> and I, I recited the lyrics to the Dylan song. I explained the, the cultural significance of them, and then yes. I went to the Bubble Butt song and just recited that and to prove a point, which I don't know if it, it connect, completely connected to all of them, but I found it hilarious to recite these lyrics. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I will use music references. I use a lot more because of, of the sort of the TV, uh, radio, and film aspect of the classes. I'll use a lot more examples from there. And, you know, it, sometimes the students don't necessarily know the references I'm using. So is there anything uh, current that you use them. more often than others? I use the stuff that I like. So okay. uh, if, it, if Game of Thrones is in season, go. they're going to hear about Game of Thrones multiple times each class. Um, if it could, I'll, you know, it's, sometimes I'll throw in something from Stranger Things. Um, I might throw in something <laughs> even from Big Bang Theory. I, I'm, I'm a consumer of media, so I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the different things going on. Um, I, I'm, sur I, you I'm know, surprised you have all the time you have and all the classes you have to have to grade and all the other <laughs> things you have to do. I'm surprised that you can follow along. And, you know, I, honestly, we can always get into a talk about how the Game of Thrones producers are now going to delve themselves into the Star Wars franchise, which is another story. And the final season of Game of Thrones. We could go on for hours about that, I'm sure. But uh, uh, Well, you so, know, what, the, what I will say is interesting is that, you know, I, some of my movie references, I'll reference The Godfather. Absolutely. Even... Even um, I'd you know, show it in class if you could. Win. Yeah, <laughs> I really would. <laughs> That's honestly from every when it comes to what every person was supposed to do in that movie. It's exceptional from the writing to the yeah. cinematography to everything that was done. It is always it still holds as a great example of telling a story, of crafting the story, and doing the full project and making it. You know, something that's just, you recite everything, you remember it, and you keep going back and you find new things you did not notice in the movie, even like you've watched it a hundred times, like I have. And it's it's true, and, and the one thing I will say is that, you know, sometimes I'll do a reference and I'm like, who in here has seen that? And I'll get a couple people raise their hands or half the class that raises their hands. Yeah. I'm like, well, what what do you all watch? And, you know, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the cartoon Rick and Morty. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, they were the ones I actually who were like, enjoy well, it. I love Rick and Morty. Yeah. And I was like, what is Rick and Morty? Uh, so about a month ago, I was like, well, I'm just going to start DVRing some Rick and Morty episodes. And yeah. since then, I've now DVR'd every Rick and Morty episode that's on and gone through about half of them. And I'm like, you know what? I like this show. It's, it's um, quite smart. Uh, actually, uh, you know, adults can appreciate it. It's it's not a, it's not kid friendly at all. It's just uh, no. it, it's it's. It's kind of have well, it's it's the same kind of appeal that South Park or Family Guy or uh, things like that have. It really does. It's just it's smarter and plus and, it's and, edgier. And that's the thing. I, I feel like I've gotten to learn from my students what they're interested in, yeah. which then allows me to use better references in class. Um, I'm still not going to give up. I'll tell them I'm like you know who's who's seen. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about how you have novelists whose books then become uh, movies. 
And I said, we, you know, who knows who wrote Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile? And they're like, nope. I'm like, it's Stephen King. And they're like, well, we haven't seen those. And I'm like, <laughs> you haven't seen Shawshank Redemption? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, that's why you're not fr- we're not friends. Uh, you know, to me, that, that you can't not see Shawshank Redemption and not love Morgan Freeman in that movie. Yeah, really and, you know, it's, it's those types of things. Mm-hmm. I, I think to, a, to an extent, you know, every once in a while, a student will come up at the end of the semester and be like, so you kept talking about such and such, and I saw it. It's pretty good. I'm like, I know. Like, I, that's why I keep talking about it. It is a good film or it is a good show. Uh, and, and that's, I think one of the things is if, if I wasn't actually learning from them as well in terms of, what they dig so that maybe my references could could be more relatable. I think it would be harder to teach. Um, I, I think it would probably be less enjoyable for me as well. But here's the question now. What is it that, it, when it comes down to it, do you feel like you're, you're, do you feel enriched or do you feel like you're still getting quite a bit of entertainment with what projects are out now, like what cable and streaming and movies and music is bringing to us now. Are you able to, you know, put yourself into the kids' shoes and say, uh, you know, like you said, like a Rick and Morty, are there other things besides that that you really enjoy that is, is, is a, almost can stand the same level as what you've watched in the past or listened to in the past? You know, when it comes to TV shows, I, because I, I, I think back to some of the shows of, you know, just some of the great television of the 80s, of you course. think about, um, you know, MASH. Like, I could still turn on an episode of MASH. <laughs> Granted, MASH was on. You can watch MASH like, anywhere. Very, it's on like seven times a day on cable if you're looking for it. <laughs> True. Seriously. It, it was on some of my very, very early years. Yeah. But I, I feel as, I know I, I sat there through the, the season finale of MASH, and I'll even bring it up in class. Uh, you know, a show like Cheers, which I think was great to me, was. doesn't necessarily hold up as well as maybe MASH does. Um, the Wonder Years. I think like anything that kind of had that period piece aspect to yeah. it just holds up really well because it doesn't seem like it's, a, it's forced references um, that you might get on some of the other ones. But, you know, there's the, the type of shows in terms of the jokes or the violence mm-hmm. or some of the other things I think just makes TV very different. Anything that's on HBO is nothing that could have been on the network TVs in the 80s and 90s. You know, if you think about all the controversies with uh, Married with Children, that <laughs> seems so tame now compared to what you have on HBO. Now, um, and, you know, I love. Like, I, I got to get to a certain point here. Uh, forgive me. I this yeah. now is a great point. I got to bring to you because there were certain things like Married with Children that you could never get away with today on television or, or any other media right now. And this is this will be a, a touchy question because a lot of people are very. It's a. I like this podcast to be very apolitical. I am I am Switzerland. I am neutral. I do not bring my political opinions on any programming. And that's on any programming that I do. And the thing is, for the radio entities that I work for at their command, we put a disclaimer out there. You want to say your piece? You have the freedom of speech to say it. I, you know, I'm Voltaire here, okay? I defend the right for you to say what you think and what you feel. And the same for the students. My question is, is because something like the 2016 presidential election has truly just thrown everything into a, in, into a spin. However you think about it, it's a matter of how are the students consuming media? Are the political constructs, are they having a political bias that's getting into play that's playing a role as to what they're watching or when they're putting anything out creatively, are they able to keep their politics out of it? Or do you think that's something that is acceptable and should be encouraged. Well, actually, what I mean, and I'm kind of in. A, I feel as though I'm in a similar role to you when I'm in the classroom. Yes. You know, I, I will tell them, uh, I'm not here for you to vote Republican or Democrat. I just want you to know why you're voting one way or the other. Yeah. Um, and even when it comes to when it comes to topics of religion, I'm not saying you got to believe. You don't have to believe. I tell them I'm Irish Catholic. That's where my mother's from. <laughs> right. uh, I have Irish citizenship, so I'm, I'm, okay. I'll just throw that out there. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not my role to try to convince them one way or the other. Uh, I had instructors in the past who let their political or religious beliefs come out in ways that I just found offensive. Um, I, not at the University of Florida, but it, it right. happened. Um, and you know, it was like, no, I, I don't want to be that type of person when it comes to the students, you know, if we're having a discussion, if I'm in the ethic, if I'm teaching ethics and we're having a discussion, it starts to get 
a little too political um, or a little too cultural in terms of different topics. There's some times where I'm just like, okay, Zach Morris, time out. We're done. Uh, we're going to move on from this topic because uh, Zach it's, Morris, it's time headed out. down a rabbit hole that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and like two of them will laugh because they'll get the reference we'll and the rest yeah. of them are like, I don't know what he means. Oh, yeah. that's so, uh, good. so it, yeah. it's one of those things I'm not trying, like when it comes to the, you know religion and politics, I'm not trying to tell them what to do or believe regardless of the topic. You know, again, it's, Hey, I want you to vote. So long as when you go in there, you know why you're pulling the lever or right, you know, making the X next to whose name. No, yeah, uh, and also but, for me, it's like also have your own, you know, don't have anybody read it to you or have to tell you what it's all about. I mean, it, of course, it's good that you're there as a, as, you know, as a, as a fi- authority figure that can say, this is what you should know, but then also uh, add to the fact that they should also read for themselves. Have your opinion. Don't have somebody have to go ahead and lay on theirs to you and follow along. It should be yours. It should be your decision and no one should really have to, you know, do anything to sway that opinion. It should just be yours. You choose to think how you like. Well, it, I mean, there are exceptions. Like, I'll tell sure. them The Godfather is one of the best movies of all time, and if they disagree, they're wrong. Um, but, you know, <laughs> exactly. other than things like that, where I, I, I make sure they're, they're fully aware of, of the the kind of the cultural media that I think is, is important. But, I mean, kind of like what you're saying, that, you know, if you look at, uh, I, I think about Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles <laughs> would never get made no. in 2018. <laughs> no. Um, you would probably not see all in the family made in 2018. No. Uh, so yeah, the, the the media has changed in certain ways, but you know, you think about at least with the level of violence on some shows. You know, I, I'm obviously Game of Thrones. I mean, you want to talk about a violent TV? Oh, the show Red Wedding. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, the, the the Red Wedding, the Purple Wedding, um, when <laughs> the Mount, you know Mount beats you know Oberyn, <laughs> lots of examples. Yeah. Uh, I watch Westworld again. You know, there's a lot of violence in Westworld. Exactly. Um, and it's one of those things that it has changed. I'll even talk about in, in my classes about how you look back through media and it's like when Elvis appeared on TV, they framed the shots. So you couldn't see his hips yep. jiggle. Um, or I Love Lucy, where Lucy and Ricky couldn't be in the same bed together. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like how media has changed. And part of that's because we, all of our, basically everyone's frame of reference to an extent seems to begin the day we're born. And nothing exists prior to that. Uh, and this semester, I have a student who's born in 2000, uh, who on September 11th, it wasn't even I'm watching my cartoons. It's I'm not aware of the world oh, at that point. Wow. Um, and, you know, you have to explain kind of how what the references in some of these movies or TV yeah. shows or, you know, we talk about the delivery style of Edward R. Murrow during World War Two. And I'm like. So World War II, this is the type of media that existed, and this is why it changed. Or the inverted pyramid style and its, its connection to the Civil War and no. the Telegraph. And, you know, because it, the, even if, no, granted, I wasn't alive in the Civil War or World War II, but uh, as an undergrad, I was a history major and find it fascinating. So that probably goes back to the whole documentary thing, too. Well, also, but, I want to make a mention of a movie with Edward R. Murrow, the one that uh, yeah. Clooney made, Good Night and Good Luck, was quite good, just as a reference if they ever want to throw the students at that's not a bad way to kind of take a look at how things were back then anyway so thought i'd make a reference to that true and and you know it's it's just one of those things where you try to give them information and make it relevant as best as possible mm-hmm. and, and there's obviously different ways of doing it some could be using cultural references some you know kind of using the credibility of somebody else bringing them in to explain it um, sometimes it's using your own personal stories of this is what happened to me and this is why you should do this. It, it really comes down to just, you know, nobody learns the same way. Nobody, you know, nobody comes to the same conclusion the same way. And it's just trying to find different ways to kind of lead everybody to an understanding that you can never know too much. No. Uh, you know, the Oscar Wilde, you can be too overeducated or overdressed, essentially. Now, I do have to talk about politics about one place, radio. <laughs> Because there totally is, okay? That's a place I'll start crapping on all day long. You worked in Clear Channel. You worked in a cluster in, uh, where, which uh, area did you work in again uh, for Clear Channel? Charlotte, Central Virginia. Okay, Central Virginia. University of Virginia. So you obviously probably had the same experience I had in a cluster when it came to all these different radio stations. Of course, around 2001 to 2003, you were there. It's around the time where, you know, they had acquired all these different stations probably I'm guessing Clear Channel had just acquired some of those stations that you had worked for 
a couple of years previous. And is that right? Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. And so it's around that time, I'm guessing, where things were, you know, micromanaging cuts, you know, some of the formats start changing around a little bit and we just get a little more automated as we go. So what was it like being in there during that period at Clear Channel and seeing what they were doing with all of those stations and how management was uh, handling things at the time? Well, what was interesting is when I, I had applied for a job at the oldie station of all things, and I mm-hmm. spoke to the program director of the oldie station. He was like, well, we've got some things going on, so why don't you like, get, call me back next week? And I call back the following week. Well, we've still got some things going on. Call me back next week. Call back next week. Talk to the uh, ops manager. Talk to the ops manager. We're flipping formats on the oldie station to <laughs> a classic rock station. The person you're talking to is no longer going to be working with us. We have another person. Oh. I'll get you in touch with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, my very first kind of introduction to clear channel was <laughs> I interviewed with a person whose station was about to be flipped and they were losing their job. Oh my God. Um, and while I was there, you know, we, it was one of those things where I, I want to say, I don't remember the exact numbers, but there was a point when I was working at clear channel, I think they owned about 1600 radio stations yes. across the country. And their biggest rival was infinity radio Correct. and they CBS. owned like 250. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. and it was like that. Their biggest rival was like an eighth the size. I mean, Clear Channel was just a behemoth across the country, and you know, every everything was market tested, and we could only play this song or that song, uh, and you know, then it, everything was kind of automated. We had a morning show out of North Carolina, um, then we had a um, daytime part that I, the person was in um, Vermont. <laughs> then our Voice afternoon tracking. drive. Yeah, it was voice tracking. Their afternoon drive was local, but then our oh. um, evening was out, was voice tracked out of Richmond. Oh, and, and how many how many songs overnight. on that playlist there? Uh, you know, it was not a whole lot. Although <laughs> you know, certain songs could play. Uh, there was I remember there was one song, and I can't remember the name of the song. It was allowed to play every twenty eight days. That was as often it was allowed to be in the rotation. Oh, um, so if you happen to catch it every twenty eight days, you could have to wait twenty eight more to hear it again. Let me guess, it was not um, Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and luck- now what I will say is, lucky enough, I worked at a uh, modern classic rock station. Oh, so we okay. had Guns N' Roses, we had Metallica, at oh, least okay. some of their hits. Uh, and then we got a new general manager, and the general manager disagreed, and Metallica and Guns N' Roses went away, oh. and in came uh, you know Electric Light Orchestra, uh, and and some of the. Uh, those type songs yeah. and my program director got fired and uh, they had fired the program, the, the morning show on another station uh, in the cluster and moved the morning show host to the program director of my classic rock station. Despite the fact that morning show person had been on an uh, adult contemporary station for about 20 years. <laughs> so you just saw that, you know, people were getting, like, there was one point people were getting fired left and right. And you're like, um, I'm just glad I'm the cheapest person on the payroll. So they won't <laughs> fire me. But now th- let me ask you this, uh, from your experience in radio, I-, I imagine what I also tell to students I had a chance to answer with, and I'm sure the students you get to teach, uh, do you create the illusion that they should be what I would call a Swiss army knife where they should have, multiple upon multiple skill sets wherever they're going is that important for you to point that out to the students i think i think it would be important for anybody to point out uh one if you just look at you know young people these days they're it's not 50 60 years ago you maybe finish high school you go get a job at the factory you retire after 30 years and you get a gold watch you know they're all going to graduate and have five six seven eight jobs Mm -hmm. by the time they finally do retire uh, depending on what the economy is doing, maybe at the right. age of 92. Uh, but <laughs> it's important to have all the different skills, whether it's to be in front of a camera, or be behind a camera, to edit, to do video, to use different types of um, video editing software, to take photographs, to be able to write long form, short form. And I, I stress upon all those different things because the last thing that they want to happen is, you know, for them to actually get lucky, you know, a lot of the things I, I even talk to them about, you know, whether or not life is fair. And I'm like, no, life is fair. And it's just that some people are handed opportunities and you're not, but they're prepared for them. 
uh, and I will usually call on the, some of the athletes in the classes, and I'm like, so you're on the you know, UF football team, UF basketball team. They're like, yep. I'm like, so you just show up to the games and you do well, right? They're like, uh, no. I'm like, do you have to practice? Do you have to train? Do you have to eat well? So you have to do a lot of things to then be recognized as a you know, collegiate athlete. And I'm like, it's the same thing here. So if we talk about backpack journalists or multimedia journalists, um, yeah, like I, I really try to get them to realize it's important to be well-versed in a number of skills so that if an opportunity happens, they're ready to take advantage of it. When it comes to iHeartMedia, which was formerly Clear Channel, uh, mm-hmm. what, I mean, do you feel like karma is being played now that they're about to face Chapter 11 bankruptcy? I wouldn't say karma. I, I Only from the fact that I work, and I'm sure you know the same thing. Yeah. There's, one, there's a difference between the salespeople and management people versus the grunts on the programming side. and you know, Which are all great people, by the way. Uh, let me just say that, first of all, because <laughs> I will not say anything to the corporate suits because they just... They just have no place what they're doing in management, but there are some great people in programming and production that have been swindled, hornswoggled, and have been defamed. They've been humiliated almost to the point where, it, you know, it's like they're a figment of what they formerly were. It feels horrible. And, and that's the thing. Like, I, you know, I, I, have, I worked at Clear Channel in 2003, so it's been 15 years. And because of social media, I still keep in touch with those people. You know, I haven't seen some of them in 15 years. Um, and, you know, I had, a, I had a birthday the other day that I was getting birthday, you know, wishes from them. Um, oh. They like pictures that I do. They send me messages. You know, the, the peop- that's the part that I think would bother me because I saw when there's cutbacks or there's any kind of financial difficulty, the people that get hit the hardest – are the people on the programming side, you know, and that's the part that I wouldn't say is sort of karma because they're, they're the ones who probably deserve it the least and get paid the least as well. Right. Uh, so it, it depends on what we're talking about. So when you talk to your students, when they leave, uh, what is one of the most important messages you try to lay across them so that they can be career ready? Um, the biggest thing is just to network, to be honest, um, because, you know, if, if there's a, a job that's open, 100 people apply for it. And the way to get your resume put on the top is to know somebody who's there. And that means you, you make connections on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter. And, you know, you make those connections not so that you can ask, you, you know, send a friend request on and suddenly you go, hey, do you have any jobs for me? Um, but to develop a relationship with people. And that's the best way to find out, even when you, you start getting into the workforce, finding out about other opportunities that are out there. Um, and also just learning from the people who are in the careers that you want, what their lives are like. What, you know, what, what do they talk about? What do they do? What is their past? What's their experience? So that you know you can try to at least model what you're doing in school and, and the opportunities you can take advantage of after them, uh, rather than, again, being like me and graduating and going, hey, I have a diploma. You all want to hire me, don't you? You don't? I don't know why. Um, and I, I think networking is, is the key most of all. Personal branding is also a huge thing of showcasing what you can do and how you can do it through having you know, professional accounts and, and promoting the work that you've done, having a website where you can promote the work that you've done, even business cards. Like I'll, I'll talk to them about still having that old school business card to hand to somebody at, you know, when you, when, if you go to an expo or if you go to a remote or if you're just yeah. doing anything. And there's just a lot of different ways. And sometimes the, the students, you know, I've been at UF, this is my 11th year. Sometimes the students who have had the most success after graduation weren't necessarily the most talented. They were just the hardest workers in terms of letting people know, here's what I am, here's what I can do, uh, and promoting themselves. Well, you've got some great kids you're turning out of, out of UF, and I know quite a few that have uh, made their way into some way in the media and there's some good kids, and I'll tell you what, uh, we were, before we were recording, there was a phrase I was looking for, and I kept scrambling around. I have figured it out again, and I want to leave you with this, saying that with all the work that you are teaching to kid, to the students and to let parents know that social media marketing is a very good stepping stone 
towards wherever you want to go in your career. That's the word I was looking for. I cannot find it for the life of me, but I'll tell you, it's great what you're doing, teaching these children and, and just children. I keep saying it's, it's adults. It's a matter of that. They, they're still growing up. Like they're still, they need yeah. to adapt. And if they cannot get the pleasure of taking one of your courses by attending University of Florida, how can they keep in touch with you? Uh, honestly, you know, it goes back to me teaching them about personal branding. Like if, if you have one, if you want to work in media, then you want to be found and you make a consistent brand. So I've been fortunate enough that um, when my family came through Ellis Island, it was they couldn't understand what they were saying, made up a last name. Uh, which makes it real easy to find Celepac because there's not a whole lot of us. No. So it's pretty much a Celepac with everything, a Celepac for the website, for Instagram, for Twitter, and so forth. Um, and and you know you could it's, I'm easy to be found. S E L E P A K Celepac. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Well, Professor, thanks for making time to go and be with us on the show. I'm I'm got, glad we got a chance to go and talk and. Uh, Hopefully, you know, let's see about getting another chance to, you know, have some run around with the students. Um, please pass it along to them. I'd love to get their feedback on this and see what they say about the whole subject. And hopefully it becomes topic of discussion in class. Will do. All right. Thank All you. All the best. Thank you. So if I had to go and pick movies I want to go and watch this weekend, game night, Jason Bateman, Rachel McAdams end up with more than they bargained for when a night of fun turns deadly. Which is the movie I'm going to go see, and I will go ahead and review that one this weekend. And the other movie that's coming out that people are going to probably go watch is Annihilation. Biologist Natalie Portman enters a mutating world in order to save her husband. Oscar Isaac, who, as a matter of fact. The movie looks interesting, looks scary to me, so that was the one thing I didn't want to go see. And, you know, figuring out, like, it's kind of sci-fi, other world kind of stuff. I'm like, ugh. Oh, much, but that's what we got. And now that's like I said, game night looks like the funny one to me. And I forget if there's anything else that's coming out that looks interesting. Because you have to think about the fact that Black Panther is going to be still dominating most of the theater screens in every theater that you go to around the country. And there's not going to be anything that's going to go ahead and beat Black Panther in the box office to become number one. I don't think so. So in a few weeks here on the show, we do have a couple of interviews we are setting up. I want to give you a little heads up of those. You can look forward to those coming up pretty soon. We have blockbuster cinematographer Luc Montpellier. He'll be joining us with a fantastic conversation. We talked a lot about when it comes to all the things that you have to deal with, when it comes to the uh, talent, when it comes to the crew on the set, and the kind of hardships, the obstacles they had to go through. There's so much he tells in that story, which is really amazing, cool, and interesting. Also have Darren Campo, who is a former show executive, and what he's done in the past You know, he was Senior Vice President of Programming Strategy of Food Network and Cooking Channel. Worked for Senior Vice President of Programming, Production, and Development for True TV. He was there for the transition from Court TV to True TV and also worked at CBS. He's also written a series of um, best-selling science fiction books. And he's a currently an adjunct professor at the NYU Stern School of Business. We'll talk to him very soon on the program. We'll have him all scheduled and set up to go. And then leading up to my next story, Blade Runner 2049. It's among one of the movies which might win Oscars for audio editing and audio mixing. So at the 65th Annual Golden Reel Awards, which were held last weekend in Los Angeles, Blade Runner won in the Outstanding Achievement in Sound Editing slash Effects Foley category, which corresponds most closely to the Academy Awards Best Sound Editing category. And we're going to talk to the ones that won that Best 
achievement and sound editing. We're going to talk to the guys that did the audio mixing for Blade Runner 2049 on a really interesting interview. We'll talk to Oscar-winning re-recording sound mixer Doug Hemphill, who worked on movies like Master Commander, Far Side of the World, The Last of the Mohicans, and Oscar-nominated sound mixer Ron Bartlett. You may remember some of his work in The Fifth Element and Deepwater Horizon. And they both work together in a group called Formosa Group. We're going to talk about them as well. we got them coming up on the program. So that's all coming up here on the show. Guests galore. We'll keep trying and see how it goes. We'll see if all of you like it. And, and by all means, please criticize me if you think I'm not that good an interviewer, if you think I suck, if you think I'm not asking good questions. You let me know. You'll let me know, and then I'll just come back, and all I can do is do better. But I do take criticism well, and I will definitely take it and use it to correct myself, make myself a better interviewer, better podcast host. You know, you got to just tell me about it, and I'll do it. So congratulations to Blade Runner 2049. Nothing big on TV this week. I just know a couple of shows are coming back. Saw Gotham's coming back on TV. I'm looking forward to that. First two weeks of Homeland have been fantastic. Damn, Carrie. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. It's getting good. It's going to be a good year, even if it's not in like some sand-soaked nation like Iraq or Pakistan or whatever. It looks really good. I'm looking forward to it. Now. TV's not worried about trying to make better shows and things like that. Oh, they're just worried about the TV measurement. Oh, we're not getting the right ratings. I think the ratings are wrong. They're wrong. Okay. So now I have a story from Forbes that says why ACR data is poised to be the future of TV measurement. This is from Alan Wolk. ACR is what's called automatic content recognition. It's data from smart TVs that might be one of the most revolutionary ways for networks and advertisers to measure viewing habits. To measure viewing habits, excuse me. The process is put into place when the viewer first unboxes their TV set. As they are installing it, a screen pops up asking them if they're willing to share what they're watching. The language is often couched in terms like, in order to receive better recommendations, will you allow us to track what you're watching? That's changing. In light of a 2017 FTC ruling requiring TV set manufacturers to be more upfront about their intent. But the reality is that no matter how upfront they are, most people are just in a rush to get the TV set up that they blow through those initial setup screens. The good news is you can go back and change your responses. Once the owner's given permission and hooked the TV to the internet, it's full steam ahead. And a smart TV's manufacturer is free to collect that data and use it as they see fit. So keep that in mind, folks. That might be happening to you. So. The value will be, it's the only way to get glass level measurement on what people are watching. This is what the corporate people care about. The numbers, what they can sell. Instead of what they can do to actually create numbers, they're worried about trying to make sure they're getting every number they possibly can because they can't pull the numbers. That's what it comes down to. So whether they're watching Hulu on a Roku, ABC doing using a rooftop antenna, or an on-demand show from Comcast via set-top box, or a show that they're watching via DirecTV now on an Xbox, it will be counted. The value of ACR data will continue to grow, become a $5 billion business by 2021. Who needs Nielsen? Because we're desperate for numbers. We have to have reports, numbers, reports. We're scared because we're going to lose our audience. We have to find some way to get the numbers set up so that we don't get stuck. That's what it comes down to. That's what they're doing. Just pointing out the facts. That's why they're doing what they're doing. Now on the music, Quincy Jones, he put an apology for some outlandish comments that he made during some recent interviews regarding the entertainment industry. In a GQ interview, which we talked about a few weeks ago, he mentioned Taylor Swift's songwriting, Ray Charles' drug use, Michael Jackson stealing songs, to name just a few topics. 
and then other things that were going on. Oh, he also called the legendary rock band the Beatles no playing motherfuckers. That's what he said. That was in another interview. Then there was a family intervention from his daughters about his comments leading to a public apology via Twitter. And here's what he said. Okay. A couple weekends ago, my six daughters, whom I'm beyond proud of, took me aside to do a surprise family intervention because of some silly things I've said in two recent interviews. And I have learned my lesson. Let me tell you, I'm so grateful for my daughters because da, 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 da. when you've been fortunate enough to have lived such a long and crazy life and you recently stopped drinking three years ago, certain details about specific events which do not paint the full picture of my intentions nor experiences come flooding back all at once. And even at 85 years old, it's apparent that word vomit and bad mouthing is inexcusable. I'm sorry to whom any words of mine were offensive and especially sorry to my friends who are still here with me and to those who aren't. There you go. <laughs> Bill Burr Hot 100. Once again, another big week for the week ending February 24, 2018. Looking at the top 10, Stir Fry Amigos dropped two points from 8 to 10. All the stars, Kendrick Lamar and Zah from the Black Panther soundtrack, Went up from 31 to 9. Dulipa's new rules went down from 6 to 8. 7 is meant to be. BB Rex and Florida Georgia Line. Look Alive, another featured Drake song with Block Boy JB. Comes all the way up to number 6. Everything he does, Drake just turns the gold. Rockstar remains at 5. Havana remains at 4. Finesse stays at 3. Perfect stays at 2. God's Plan, fourth week, number 1. And if you look at the numbers of streams on Spotify alone, the third week of God's plan, it pulled what, like, what was it? The top before was like maybe 22 million streams. And God's plan got like 45 million streams on Spotify. Like, good Lord. There's no stopping God's plan. It's just going to stay up there. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> That's just it. It also reached the mainstream hip-hop R&B chart in the fastest time possible of any record on that chart ever. In what? Two weeks. Incredible. Went from number, what, four to number one. Just like that. But it goes right to number one, God's plan, a few weeks ago, and it's just going to stay there. Amazing. Four weeks on the chart, biggest gain in airplane, biggest gain in air pay, play, and gains in performance. Congratulations. Music Ali, there was on here about music streaming is booming, so what happens next? And I was wondering what these people in the industry were saying about themselves. You had a bunch of people that are from the UK talking about different music and how it's working out. Saying the role of artists and streaming's impact on them was the first topic of for discussion. And from... Jeremy Pritchard, a musician from the British band Everything Everything, he quoted a saying, every time I put an album out, because we still work in that method, the long playing album, every time we do, every two, two and a half years, the playing field has altered. So the idea is, and this is for those of you out there looking to make records, the truncation of the album cycle for one, the rollout, Pritchard says, regardless of how long it is prior to the album, in week two, week three, you're struggling to keep it in people's minds. So when Arcade Fire had put out eight singles before the album even dropped, and they weren't even able to buck the trend, the album may now be a culmination of a campaign, in other words. So this is from an executive, a record executive named Ann Jeniskins. She says that many of our clients release more often and smaller products in, in, in more singles, EPs, and every once in a while an album. Artists have to release more frequently. And then another panelist says that there's an enormous amount of power that the streaming services hold. The big question that we need to address soon, especially with companies like Spotify becoming more like labels, at what point do they start promoting their own artists? That's a good question. So 
So Pritchard compared playlist pitching in the streaming world to the radio in the 1960s and 70s, like payola. You have to have the relationships. He didn't say payola. I said it. You have to have those relationships, he says. Some people are further ahead in their relationships with DSPs. The major label industry is still working that out. The majors are still working on how to forge those relationships. Yeah, they're trying to get their way in there. Then there was talk about the algorithmic playlist on these services. In which theory can put an artist's music in front of the fans who already love them and the potential fans who already haven't heard them yet but are likely to love them. Question was given by Jeniskins. How can artists and labels strive in that world? Complete and correct metadata is crucial. That means including names of contributors, all kinds of information that can help a music service or an algorithm surface your music as a match. Then I get into more analytics and really a little more technical momo jumbo that I'm not looking to get into. And then there was a question about if there are ways that streaming, digital streaming, is changing the way music is written and recorded. Several recent articles have talked about the Spotify effect of artists and producers bending their art towards what works well on streaming services. If you're in the business of hits at any cost, in the same way that you might have heard Phil Spector on the radio in the 60s and thought, I'm going to ape that sound, you might do that now. So yeah, if you find something that works, you find a gimmick, you stick with it and milk it for as much as it's worth. Which is interesting because, you know, that's what leads into our other story, which I'll talk about in a moment about the kind of songs that you hear in digital streaming, which is quite interesting, but I'll explain why it's not a bad thing. I wouldn't be lying. Pritchard says if we didn't structure songs, at least a quarter of the record with radio and thus streaming in mind, we did actually bend to that will. So it is affecting the way people structure songs and it's certainly affecting the way that you sequence an album. If streaming is the dominant consumption form for music in the future, is listening becoming even more of a lean-back experience? So less engaged and more casual like traditional radio? I don't think it's much like that. And Pritchard agrees that people listen to a playlist passively rather than individually choosing track by track what they'll listen to. So it's not totally black and white, but it's moving in that direction. The mass user has always been a lean-back type person. That's why radio has been so successful, a panelist says. Does this bring risks for artists, though making it harder for them to build core fans? Or do people just become fans on playlists? Well, that's what I think it is. For myself, if you're looking to know what to like, this is why I understand where they're coming from here, but this is what it comes down to. There are factors outside of the music streaming that determine what songs get into the charts. See, I don't listen to the playlists on Spotify that are just kind of created. Okay? Some of them I do. There are some that are created because they offer new music. That's what I'm importantly trying to listen to. So if I want to listen to reggaeton, hip-hop, pop music, new stuff. That's what I have. So I have several lists that I go through, a playlist that I'll go listen to on a regular basis. There is uh, Baila Reggaeton, which is all Spanish reggaeton. That's the Spanish, basically the hits in Spanish right now. Fuego, which is like a mix of like kind of a Spanglish turban kind of format, right? So you have some Spanish remixes of certain English songs and some reggaeton mixed into that as well. And then I put on Hot Rhythmic, which is the idea of a CHR Rhythmic Station if they were keeping up with the times. Otherwise, the reason I went to Spotify in the first place was to listen to the charts. Because Spotify is the best place to launch the charts. I can listen to the entire Billboard Hot 100 right there on Spotify. Updated every week by Billboard. That's what made me buy them not only for the ten ninety nine a month originally, but now buying them for ninety nine dollars a year. I went ahead and bought the full damn year. I'm premium for life because that Billboard Hot One Hundred is great. Not only that, there are people that actually construct the charts in the UK, the official chart, which is the same thing as Billboard in the UK, 
charts the songs that the BBC plays, BBC Radio 1 plays in the UK, which usually is a great mix of music out there. And given the fact that I really enjoy all this British reggae type rap that's coming out there from all these British uh, rappers and, and, and stars out there that are, it's just a real great mix. Plus so many great American songs that are out there. And you just hear the top 40 of them. It's like, wow, diverse. And the funniest part is that I watch the chart and I look at it. Those are the songs you're playing in the UK. Billboard? No. Which one of these days I'm going to when there's a when there's a short week and we don't have a whole lot going on in the show and I'm actually extra extra time I'm going to go ahead and continue to berate the radio industry and go after the radio industry week after week and hope to bring on a guest that will help defend my uh, this argument that I have each and every week as to why they are not paying attention to music streaming and trying to stay antiquated in their old ways and embrace the measurement of digital streaming and embrace what Billboard is doing once again. What they've always done. Billboard was the trendsetter of what music was popular in every genre because they do the best job of it. All I got to say is your gauge of how out of touch radio is, just look at the list that America Top 40 uses every week. Now, I know people don't probably listen to that show that much. It's still out there, okay? It is a nearly 50-year institution. And for at least... You actually had a well-run countdown, whether it was Casey Kasem, who was the best... And Shadow Stevens, which, by the way, I've listened to some of his uh, air checks on how he sounded, which I didn't listen so much because Casey was available on the uh, on other channels. But Shadow Stevens was pretty good. You know, he might not have been the same as Casey Kasem, but Shadow Stevens on his own was very good at doing that countdown show. Very good. He did not disappoint people by doing that show. But what is disappointing is, is that radio... For all that they do to try to go ahead and follow social media, they don't take the time to look at what's on YouTube, to listen to what's on Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music and all these different streaming outlets and seeing what the most popular songs are, regardless of what those other streaming channels have, because there are custom made playlists. But guess what? Spotify has a viral top 50. Okay. iTunes as an ongoing top 100 of their own in the u.s in the uk canada has their own charts uk has their own charts australia has their own charts every country that has significant musical acumen has charts their own official chart service and why billboard is neglected by radio year after year since 1991 that's when it happened that's when it started because that's when the change in the mainstream of hip-hop music coming into play and rock music, all this different music that was just, you know, it wasn't like how rock was before where you had the what's called classic rock or album rock or progressive rock, which was part of that Billboard Hot 100. And those songs would be played along with disco songs and pop songs and middle-of-the-road adult contemporary type songs. All that got used to all that used to be played on a pop station, on a on a rock station. Now so segmented. This is something where it has to go down to an ongoing change altogether and the way radio is programmed. This is something I'm going to continue to hamper on and I hope one of these days it will change. But I will be here on my soapbox on this very program talking about that subject. Every week as much as possible. I'll be here for that. Interesting little subject. I had to bring this up. Nationalenquire.com. I used to read National Choir. Before TMZ got really popular, I got really big into National Choir. I used to buy those magazines, you know, every week. Make sure I got the first ones on Thursdays, which were available at Walmart. And I was always at it.
So here's what's happening. Music business honchos are about to join their pervy Hollywood pals in society's doghouse because there's a new blockbuster tell-all book due this fall. Dorothy Covello wrote the book Anything for a Hit, an A&R woman's story of the surviving of the music industry. She told the National Enquirer, quote, it's a women in business story complete with sex, drugs, and rock and roll where women are held to a different standard than men. In 1987, Dorothy became, at age 25, personal assistant to Armin Artigan, the founder of Atlantic Records. a r is an artist and repertoire person. And he is a legend who discovered Led Zeppelin, Bette Midler, and Bobby Darin, among others. She said it was a fantastic opportunity, but soon she experienced the horrors women would suffer in a music world populated by creeps such as Phil Spector. She said, quote, I was a number two person in Artigan's office, but I wasn't prepared for the music business's boys club, she claimed. In 1988, on a trip to Allentown, Pennsylvania, with two VPs and an a executive, Ahmed and I were standing by the bar when he put his hand between my legs, grabbing my panties, trying to pull them off. Dorothy said she then he then worked his hands up my shirt so fast I had to fight him off. Humiliated and disgusted, Dorothy complained to label management who told her she was free to leave. Shockingly, Dorothy claimed things only got worse after she was promoted to become the first A&R executive, female A&R executive in the label's history. She curiously kept standing up for herself and kept getting smacked down by music industry's frat boys. Quote, whenever I complained about sexual harassment to the president or chairman of a company, I was fired. She said, quote, I was never offered a settlement or given a severance package. In one case, the head of a company made me apologize to my abuser. Whenever she worked, Dorothy said predators were on the prowl. The music business, like the Catholic Church, she says, moves its abusers around from label to label, she charged. To say all women have experienced sexual harassment isn't enough. We must come forward and name our abusers. Hey, don't knock the National Choir. How many times do they get do they uh, get sued these days? Not too much. If that's true, and the music industry is here for a rude awakening of sexual harassment claims, oh boy, I can only imagine what the old boys club is like these days. So be careful. That's a shame. You know, there's, I don't bring it up that much, but, you know, that was one thing that was going on before this podcast came out about all the sexual harassment claims and all these executives, the Weinsteins of the world, Russell Simmons, Charlie Walk, and all these executives that had all this power and all the power over everything creative and corporate and being able to shoot down projects and, you know, being abusive with their power and abusive of what they were able to do with their power is sickening and it's disgusting. You know, listen, if you are able to bring in women that are willing to do things or men to do things at their own bidding and they feel like, hey, you know, I don't care. You know, I'll do whatever it takes to get ahead. Well, listen, if it's consensual, that's one thing. But we're hearing too many stories where it's not that way. And that. I'm waiting to see what Dorothy comes out with. Uh, let's see what this book does. And let's see if this opens the door, much like the Ronan Farrow story, where it will open up and it will really blow the lid off of the music industry's problems with sexual harassment. We'll have all that coming up. If it comes up, we'll bring it up. We'll talk about it. So that's it for this week. Thank you all for listening in. Please make sure to keep corporate away from your creative. I'm out. Thank you for listening to the Creative Not Corporate Pop Culture and Media Podcast. To learn where to subscribe to the show and how to follow the king of podcasts anywhere on social media, go to our website at creativenotcorporate.com. That's creativenotcorporate.com. The Creative Not Corporate Podcast is brought to you by Amazon. 
shop. We're the king of podcasts. Shops for everything and anything he needs by going to kingofpodcasts.com slash Amazon. Also, check out the King of Podcasts' work every day at webmasterradio.fm and cannabisradio.com. And look for his other original podcast series, The Wrestling is Real Podcast. Learn about these and more at kingofpodcasts.com.